so uh, let's just jump right in and talk about this. Um, I already got a pretty good intro, but if you want to talk to me and I'm not around, you could find everything about me through that Twitter, following the links to that Twitter account. Um, I started and work for a company called HashiCorp. Uh, we're most well known as creating Vagrant, at least within the Cisco community, Vagrant most likely. Um, we've also created a number of other tools around that, so um, in clockwise order here, Packer, Surf, Console, Terraform, and Vault. Um, each one of these tools is being used in, surely in a website you visit on a day-to-day -day basis, um, uh, but seeing quite a bit of adoption in the DevOps space in general. So um, today I'm going to be talking uh, about the data center sort of as we see it, which is a sort of a more modern take on things. Uh, and specifically, we're going to be talking about console and Terraform. There's just each one of these, uh, each one of these open source projects is at least an hour talk on its own. And so we don't, we're not going to go into too much detail, uh, but I'm going to cover console and Terraform, which is more on the production side of things um, and is generally more interesting um, because of that. So let's get started. So I'm going to start by just talking about data center evolution sort of as we see it, um, how it helps us design our tools, how it helps how we communicate with our users, potential users, um, and important to understand just as a basis of why our tools work the way they do and uh, how we sort of design things to match this view uh, of the data center. So we're going to go through a very elementary sort of uh, increment towards where we are today. So don't get offended by like the next slide since I know you all know this stuff. Um, but sort of the way we see it obviously when we started, just one server, very simple. Um, not a lot of problems with one server. All your services are on one machine. You don't need to do any orchestration. There's no distributed systems. Like it's very simple. We can move on from there. Um, shortly thereafter, you start getting multiple servers. Um, kind of still not a management problem. Like you could still just manually babysit each server, go to each one, hard code IPs for service discovery, uh, babysit the network so that you don't have to worry about network partitions in a realistic scenario, things like that. Um, so still very simple, don't need a lot of automation. I didn't put dates on any of this because depending on the size and time period of your company, you could be sort of anywhere on this scale. So. Uh, very quickly after that, you start seeing a lot of virtual machines pop up. Um, a lot of us live in this world right now. Uh, things get a lot more complicated here. Uh, networking gets weirder, uh, potentially. The virtual machines are, you don't, you don't quite know what machine they're on. Uh, di distributed systems start coming into play. Service discovery, you can't assume it's on a local host. You can't assume it's on a fixed port. Um, and there's generally starting to be a little bit too many now. Like it, it, in this little diagram, there's 16, I think. Uh, there's generally starting to be a little bit too many now where manually setting things up is starting to become a bottleneck uh, in your organization. So this is where things start getting interesting and generally the time period I attach to this is, is sort of the rise of config management. It's around, I guess, 2007, uh, Chef, Puppet, those sorts of things when they just started their rise. Um, of course, config management itself is a lot older, but I think that VM proliferation, public cloud, all that stuff around 2007 AWS is when this management stuff started to take off. Um, and then now we have containers. So now it looks sort of like this. And this is actually a cleaner view than most things because now we have physical machines that don't have VMs. We have machines with VMs. We have VMs with containers. We have containers on machines without VMs. Um, and it's starting to get really messy. And the density is starting to get really high. So whereas before we might have had 16 VMs or even just 160 VMs, you now have an order of magnitude more. Uh, containers, um, so let's say 1600, and this, it's generally a heterogeneous environment. So you don't, you're not full container, you're not full VMs. Uh, you have sort of a mess of things going on, and this is when you really start needing tools to help you out to manage this sort of complexity. Otherwise, uh, it just becomes a crazy bottleneck to manually do things, uh, and your developers generally won't like it. And then finally, in addition to assume there's containers on those, in addition to all that. There's, there's a proliferation of services. So um, whereas if you go back maybe five years even, um, asking you know, a lot of companies like, would you put your DNS on an external service provider or CDNs or databases? Databases were much newer companies, but a lot of ops people would be like, no. Like we can never ever outsource this stuff because we have to control it, it's ours. Um, 
And over time, like every year, you're seeing more and more comfort uh, for companies to move things out to service providers. Um, again, like depending on your company, you're at a different stage with this, but um, at least DNS is pretty commonly just not run, except internal DNS. Like DNS is pretty commonly not run by your company anymore. Um, so I think that this is just a trend we'll continue seeing in the, in the future. Uh, we'll see service providers become more and more prevalent. Um, and the important thing to consider about services is they now need to be managed by tools as well because if you're trying to spin up a staging environment and your application doesn't run without the database provider, then what's the point if you could chef and puppet your entire data center up but you can't chef and puppet the service provider up? It doesn't run anyway, so what's the point of doing any of it? So our tools have to start thinking about services as a first class thing and being able to manage those things. And then now, of course, we're seeing uh, hybrid, hybrid clouds or not, not even hybrid, just transitioning clouds. So maybe you're trying to go from your on-premise thing to AWS or you're actually trying to keep stuff uh, in your physical data center and, and direct linked over to AWS or OpenStack or some other cloud. Um, but we're seeing more and more uh, hybrid scenarios. So this is layered on top of everything else. So that bringing it all together, just sort of the diagram of how, how things are uh, evolving, or things are today for a lot of companies. There's, there's a lot of chaos. And so in that, in that, there's infrastructure as a service, there's platform as a service, there's software as a service. Um, and generally, companies are using all three. Um, and not only are they using all three, but generally all three are needed to sort of deploy most applications. So um, platform as a service is probably the most infantile one in its evolution right now, but uh, definitely the, the outer ones are being pretty heavily used. So um, how do we have security across those? How do we do management across those? How do we do cost analysis? That sort of stuff becomes a very interesting problem. Uh, and then there's operating systems. So this is the easiest thing to not make complicated in your organization. Um, it's pretty easy to say we're just Linux or we're just Mac or, or, or Windows probably. Um, but more likely, I and mean, you still, even if you're a full Linux shop, I go into a lot of Linux, like 99% of the data centers are Linux, but they still have the two Active Directory machines like running over there or the SQL server. Um, so you still have some heterogeneity, but for the most part, um, for the most part, this is the easiest thing to, to solve. So that complicated sort of process is sort of where we get to today of what, what I like to call the modern data center. Uh, and so when I say the modern data center, I like to, I like to be very, it's a very specific definition for me. Um, and that, that definition is, is sort of that process and these bullet points. So I think the modern data center is inevitably heterogeneous. I think the dream of everyone up forever, not just today, but for the past 10 years, has always been homogenous data center. Make everything the same, view it as a utility, things like that. Um, my opinion, I like to say, is that homogenous data centers are a myth. Um, and the main reason I like to say that is that if you're saying you could have a homogenous data center, what you're basically saying is that either one of two things, either the technology is never going to change, so you never ever have to change, or two, that when the technology changes, you're able to, in one atomic step, switch your entire data center from point A where you are today to point B in the future. Um, and I don't think any of those are realistic, and there's a lot of evidence to back that. Um, my favorite is, uh, I, I think it was Gartner or Forrester, but one of, the, one of those big analyst firms this year for their report published that they believe 2015 is the year that the Fortune 500 completes their transition to virtual machines. Um, and, and, and a lot of newer companies are starting to talk about containers. So they're completing the VM transition today. Over the next 10 years, 15 years, depending on how you age the birth of virtual machines, uh, we're going to be transitioning to something else, and it's going to be heterogeneous. They've finally got to virtual machines, and now they're going to be this other mess. So um, I think homogeneity is, is nice to strive for, um, but ultimately you need tools that help you handle heterogeneity um, in the process to help you get from point A to point B and to some future point C. Um, the modern data center is more service oriented than ever before, so the important thing here is there's more applications, which means there's more developers working on things and there's more developers that want things deployed. So it's more important than ever that operations becomes not, uh, doesn't become a bottleneck or becomes not a bottleneck anymore. Um, that's how you get shadow ops, shadow IT, that sort of stuff. Um, so that's important to understand. Uh, and sort of the bottom point I like to say is that 
Um, this is just our, our design philosophy is that when we build tools, we like to build them for workflows because the way we view things is that workflows stay the same uh, for the most part, but the technologies constantly shift underneath. And the primary evidence I have for that is containers. So if you take a, a, a pitch deck, a sales deck, anything of containers of any sort, and you just replace the word container with virtual machine everywhere through it, it's mostly still valid. Like all their arguments, higher density, um, better cost utilization, less servers you need, like all that stuff still is like the same stuff. And then the problems that containers introduce, if you go back when virtual machines were introduced, are the same too. Like how do we handle images? How do we handle where virtual machines go? How do we handle data? Like how do we handle the network? It's just the same problems rehashed with the new technology. And so we, as much as possible when we build our tools, we try to think what's the higher level problem being solved here? Um, solve that problem and try to make all the technology underneath pluggable. Because if you could do that, then hopefully you've built a technology that lasts for the future, um, a workflow tool that will last for the future while the technology is shifting underneath it. Um, and you'll see evidence of that uh, throughout this talk. So that's the modern data center. That's what I think about, that's what our company thinks about when we build tools, when we go in and talk to people about how they should uh, evolve and adopt new tooling into their infrastructure. So now how do we tame this thing? How do we control this thing? So the, the holy grail is deployment and maintenance. The, the speed at which you get deployment out there and the uh, ability to maintain that stuff that you get out there. So it's useless to deploy something really quick, but it's very fragile. So you want something that you could deploy quickly without breaking things. And the steps for deployment and maintenance at the highest level, so we're at the workflow level, think about virtual machines, containers, physical servers, these are all the same, um, is acquire, provision, update, destroy. And if you're on like a trendy bandwagon with like immutable infrastructure or something, it's this without the update step. Like it's just, it's just a loop basically of these steps. So let's take a look at these steps. So historically, running through this cycle was kind of slow. With servers, acquiring a server was days or weeks, you know. You order it from Dell, you take it off the truck, you plug it in, you wait for things to happen. Um, provisioning, uh, same thing, you file a ticket, you wait for somebody to probably plug in and type some stuff or run some scripts and get things working. Um, so this is the time scales we were working with before. And for the purpose of this history, SAS didn't exist. Like that's the time frame we're in. But if you look at today, every single one of those categories, SAS exists first of all, but every single one of those categories is seconds. And the reason is seconds is because they all have APIs. Um, even physical machines today have APIs. So, um, I mean, uh, uh, you're able to re pull physical resources through an API, that's what I mean. Um, so, uh, servers, seconds. If you're using AWS, you could request a VM in seconds. If you're using a container, you can launch in a millisecond. If you're, when you're provisioning Chef, Puppet, uh, you get there in maybe minutes, probably not seconds. Um, but if you're using golden images of some sort, AMIs directly, something like that, seconds. Again, it's just instant. Um, SaaS, every SaaS, every major SaaS player out there has an API to create a new account. So you're able to get these things in seconds. And I think the thing that, that is obvious to some people but very not obvious to other people is that this is, like people can't work at this speed. There's the, the fact that things are happening in seconds, you just, we can't think that fast. I can't think that fast to make wide scale changes happen. So now the bottleneck becomes me as a human and not the system. Before it was like, well, we can't do anything because the truck with our servers is still three weeks out. That's back ordered or something. Um, but now the bottleneck is yes, we have, we have effectively infinite resource, pool of resources available, but I can't get it to you in time because I'm too slow. Like that becomes the excuse now. So to take advantage of this, you need some sort of help, automation, tools, that sort of stuff. One more step backwards before we just go all forwards. So the properties of a data center historically were different than they are today. But previously, you had relatively fixed sets of servers. Like it, it was, of course, you added more servers, you scaled up, um, your leases went up, you got rid of some servers. But for the most part, it's relatively fixed. It wasn't that dramatic of a shift. Um, there were fewer applications to deploy. So of course, there were things like service-oriented architectures and things like that. But for the most part, monoliths were more common. SOA was an enterprise thing. Uh, there were just less things to deploy. Fewer external services, we've talked about that. Let's assume there's no SaaS. Um, and then there's just less web traffic. There's less people on the internet. It's just a, 
just an like an absolute number less things connected to the internet. Your watch isn't connected to the internet. You probably didn't have an internet connected phone. Like things are just a little less demanding than. Uh, whereas today, you have a potentially elastic set of resources, or at least the dream is to be fully elastic set of resources. I think. Uh, the ultimate dream is that you make a web request or something and the, like, the VM or the container or whatever is responding to that web request actually didn't exist until that point the web request gets in. Like that's a crazy future but, and definitely not where we're at right now, but eventually that's how elastic we want things to be. So the elasticity is, it's not plus or minus 10 or 50 machines, it's plus or minus potentially thousands of resources depending on the scale you're at. And so that adds a lot of stress to management. Um, there's an earlier push to SOA, um, which trendily is called microservices. So that's pushing SOA down into startups and into new companies. And it means that newer companies are deploying applications, d different distinct applications at a much higher velocity. And we need to handle that both as developers and operators need to be able to figure that out. Uh, there's SaaS everywhere. Um, whether you want it or not, a developer is going to sign up for it. So you sort of just have to deal with the fact that there will be SaaS involved. Um, and then there's higher web traffic. There's just more internet connected devices. Imagine things like Netflix. Um, Netflix doesn't just need to handle people while they're at a physical computer. They need to handle people 24 seven basically because when, they're, when they leave their computer, they're switching to their phone and when they're not on their phone, uh, they're back on a computer or they're in front of an Xbox or something. And so the chance that you're connected to the internet and you're able to visit your website is much higher which just gives you absolutely more load as a, as a factor. So the scales, the, the high scale, point of a company uh, is sort of much lower because it's just going to happen. So what do we need in order, what do we need, what properties do we want uh, of our tools, of our processes in order to handle this? Um, the three, I think, most important processes to manage a, a, a traits to manage a modern data center are scalability, resiliency, and determinism. So when I say scalability, you just have to have an expectation or a strive for sort of a rigor of being able to handle a high amount of QPS per resource. Um, as load, you know, as you, especially as you become a bigger company, um, CPU and memory become much more expensive. As a startup, it's easy enough to be like, oh, we'll just buy a few more servers and handle it. But as a bigger company, being able to shave, be able to increase your QPS by 1% is a huge economic factor. Um, if you're working on the order scale-wise, technically, if you're working on the order of thousands of machines, um, push versus pull becomes an important thing. A lot of historic, uh, or legacy, I should say, tools um, were pull-based, so they would pull a lot. There's a lot of heartbeats. I'm not just talking about config management. I'm, like, I'm looking at Nagios. I'm looking at a lot of um, 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 maintenance tools, like SSH for loops and things like that. They're very heavy on a very large, uh, a large network. And so you need to switch basically from a pool based model to a push based model and, and need to adapt to that. So edge triggered changes are important. Um, and you need to get human scalability because uh, you, can't just, you can't just move, you can't just have 100 servers and let's say five sysadmins and then say you have 1,000 servers so you just 10x the sysadmins too and you have 50. Um, it doesn't really work and the reason why it doesn't work is because uh, the, the economic value per server is lower. Um, you, you can't say that 10x servers increases 10x profit, so you could, you could hire 10x the sysadmins. Uh, it just doesn't work that way just due to the scale factors and things like that of today. So 10x servers maybe is 2x profit or 3x profit, and so to handle that we need people to be able to manage more servers, and that again goes through codified knowledge tooling automation. And then there's resiliency. So as you're reaching these higher scales, the probability of failure just goes up. And that's an easy thing to understand. Um, the harder thing is you could either fight the failure, you could try to make it not fail as often as possible, or you could just accept that things are going to fail out of your control, embrace it, and build it into systems. Uh, again, this is, this is more of a technical rigor sort of thing. Um, but if you do this, you're going to lower the cost of, of recovering from things, of handling failure much more uh, than, than just trying to fight it. It's, it's just entropy, like just, it's gonna happen, it's gonna grow, don't fight it, just let it happen. So get speaking of entropy, um, self-healing systems become much more important. Um, so uh, the reason I bring that up is all our tools, effectively all our tools have a built-in concept of automatic anti-entropy. Um, the assumption that things will fail, the assumption that things will have network partitions, and being able to handle that in some expected, consistent, deterministic way. 
and then determinism. So uh, at larger scale, you could either let things be completely non-deterministic, um, eventual, just let everything happen at some point, or you could fight for some determinism. And, and this isn't fighting entropy. You just want to know that things will happen eventually or within some constraint. It's not that things must happen exactly. Um, you just need to understand you just need to understand sort of the, the full effect of a change when data will be available. Um, if I change the, IP, or the, the image or IP of this, this machine, what's the full effect of this? What goes down? That sort of stuff. Um, so determinism becomes very important and, and actually seems counterintuitive to the entropy stuff, but you'll see you could have both. So here, these, I just went through all the properties and high level theoretical sort of stuff of the modern data center. Um, and now I'm just going to dive right in and show two of our tools, which I, like I said earlier, are console and Terraform, and just show you how those tools are helping solve problems for the modern data center um, and how they work and what they do. So we're going to start by talking about Terraform, just because in the order that things happen, this is what you interact with first. Um, and I want to mention that both console and Terraform are completely open source, um, free, uh, open source license, not just open source in terms of code being available, open source license, have communities, are not open core, that sort of stuff. So. Um, there's no burden there. Um, but let's start with Terraform, and the address is down there if you don't see it. So the goal of Terraform, what it does in one concise sentence is build, combine, and launch infrastructure uh, safely and efficiently. Uh, that's nice, uh, but more practically, here are the things that Terraform answers. So if I asked you, if I just walked up to you and said, can you create a, s a completely isolated secondary uh, staging environment for this application? How, how fast can you do that, and how would you do that? Um, how do you deploy a uh, non-trivial application or update the non-trivial application? Uh, can you give me an architecture diagram of what the, what the infrastructure looks like, how data flows through it, um, and things like that? Um, and then how, in this world where we're having more and more applications, to, to eliminate ops as the bottleneck, how do we delegate some of the tasks of ops uh, to these application teams without risking stability and things like that? Um, and these are all questions that Terraform answers. Um, the answers are these, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to go through each one. <coughs> so how? Um, Terraform, in, in more bullet points, basically is a tool for creating infrastructure with code. Um, and I'm not just talking about servers. I'm talking about network switches, um, software as a service, physical machines, cloud machines, sort of everything uh, included. It could do it from code. Um, one command to create. So um, we try to push for this very hard in our tooling, which is that you want as minimal human interaction as possible. You want, you want the person to, you want a human to basically vet things and check things out, um, but then once you push it, you want the whole process to be automated because that's always going to be the slowest part is the person. Um, so one command to do everything. Uh, you could preview changes with infrastructure, so this is a very important thing. There's, uh, if you come from an open stack world, they have a tool which you might think is very similar to Terraform, which is called Heat. Um, it is kind of similar, uh, but Heat, CloudFormation, those sorts of things, they all lack this one critical feature which Terraform has, which, which honestly gives us the easiest edge when we walk into companies and, and pitch Terraform. We just say this one feature and it just, they're, they'll adopt it straight out. And that is the, the ability to preview changes to your infrastructure. So with things like CloudFormation, Heat, you, you use code to describe infrastructure, then you hand it off and it just does it. And what that does is not very deterministic. You don't know what it's actually going to do. And the thing about both OpenStack and, and, and AWS is that there's some things that can't be updated in place. If you change the IP in certain, in, in certain cases, so it's not, always the, it's not always black and white, but in certain cases, if you change the IP, it'll create a new machine. It'll destroy the old one, create a new one. Um, if you change the AMI, uh, it, of course, has to, to recreate the whole machine. And uh, AWS just has hundreds of these resources that all have these very specific, oh, these could be updated in place with zero downtime. These always cause downtime. Uh, and if X, Y, and Z, then these will cause downtime, otherwise not downtime. And, and basically, the result of that is if you use a tool like Heat or CloudFormation, you just you have to be a genius at that platform. You have to understand the full effect of your change in order to reason to to make a deterministic case of what's going to happen. Um, and geniuses just aren't scalable. You can't hire a bunch of geniuses and, and always consistently get a genius. So what you really want is be able to hire 
anybody to be able to safely make infrastructure change. So the way Terraform does that is it, it'll show you exactly what it's going to do. It'll show you if you could do it in place. It'll show you if it has to create something. It'll show you why you would have to not be able to do it, why it can't do it in place. Um, and you'll see an example shortly. Um, and then the last two points, so it, it allows you to break down your infrastructure into reusable pieces, uh, modular components, uh, and that lets you delegate things more safely, and we're going to go through that too. So the first example is infrastructure as code. Um, hopefully you could read that. I know the contrast is pretty bad. Um, but uh, infrastructure as code. So this is sort of what a Terraform config looks like, and don't be thrown back by this random format. It's just JSON but without, without a lot of noise um, right there. Less, a lot of less quotes, a lot less brackets. Um, you basically configure things you want. So on the top here, we can configured uh, a digital ocean droplet, but that could just as easily be an OpenStack instance, an AWS instance, um, a physical resource coming from an inventory manager. Um, and then below, we configure a DNS record. And the uh, important thing for this example is it's using something called DNS Simple, which is a DNS service provider. But DNS Simple has no association to DigitalOcean. They're not affiliated in any way. And yet, you could describe both in the same file, and not just describe both, but you could take the value out of a DigitalOcean thing and use it to configure DNS all within one thing. Um, and this is another critical difference between Terraform and something like uh, heat, cloud formation, but also something like configuration management. Um, no, I don't think any configuration management tool out there right now allows you to access arbitrary attributes of other things it created. So you could take arbitrary things like an IP address and use it to configure future things. Um, also on the CloudFormation heat side, they're all vendor specific. CloudFormation is just for AWS, heat's just for OpenStack. There just isn't a future where CloudFormation or heat is going to just have DNS simple in there. It just doesn't exist. So that's a very important difference. So for this, it's human-friendly configuration. Like I said, it's just JSON. So you could actually just use JSON if you wanted to. Um, it's text, so put it into version control. Version it like an application. Put it into GitHub, wherever you use uh, Bitbucket. It's declarative. I think declarative becomes very important at a certain scale because it, I think imperative is actually something that's fighting the entropy of things. And, and imperative also forces you to have a very important understanding of, of things. Like in this example, the digital ocean droplet must be created before the DNS simple record because you need the IP address. Uh, that's a very simple case. A person could easily imperatively order that. Uh, with just 100 servers, when you make a change, it becomes very taxing for a person to order things in the right order to minimize downtime and things like that. And that's exactly what Terraform does. Terraform knows what it could do in place. Terraform what knows what causes downtime. Um, Basically what it does is creates a graph and it optimizes the parallelism and the walking of that graph in order to, do, to make infrastructure change as quickly as possible with a minimal downtime impact. Um, and then the last line here, this infrastructure is code on a level not before possible. Um, obviously, I didn't invent infrastructure as code. Um, config management probably did. Um, but what I mean by on a level not before possible is you could like I said, access arbitrary attributes. You could plug in multiple cloud providers, and they don't even need to be at the same level. You saw right there, you saw an infrastructure as a service, which is DigitalOcean, and you saw software as a service, which was DNS simple, um, and you could tie those together. So Terraform supports other things too, which you wouldn't expect, perhaps, like Heroku. Um, and Git gets a weird one, but you could make a commit using the graph. Um, I could talk about that later. Um, the other thing is one command. So this isn't very exciting, but you just run Terraform apply with something, and it goes forward and does what you would expect. And the command's idempotent. Um, idempotency is incredibly important for a tool like Terraform because clouds just fail. Uh, they, just, they just have issues. So uh, when you're launching an infrastructure with a thousand servers, it's inevit inevitable that one of those API requests in there is going to fail. It just happens. Um, Terraform does a lot of retries internally, but if it retries a lot and it's just simply gone, um, then you could just rerun the Terraform command and it works. Uh, a demo I like to give is to start spinning up like a 50 node cluster and then about halfway through just turn my Wi-Fi card off um, and then turn it back on later, like after Terraform decides that it can't retry anymore and it's doomed. Uh, turn it on later, rerun Terraform, and you still get exactly what you described. Um, Terraform's really good about this. We call it partial failure modes. Um, it's highly parallelized. Like I said, the internals, what it does is build a graph. Graphs are pretty easy to parallelize. You just walk the disjunct trees on their own. Um, and we'll only do what the plan says. So that leads to this. Um, 
which is the preview mode that Terraform has, which is very different from anything else. So if you run Terraform plan, it tells you the exact changes it's going to do. Um, and the output format we use is, is we try to emulate the diff format to try to make it somewhat familiar. Um, so here we have, at the top here, it says plus DigitalOcean droplet. That means it's going to create a DigitalOcean droplet. It didn't exist before. It's going to create it. If, it. if it's just an in-place update, it would be a squiggly line. Uh, if it was just destroying it, it would be a s minus sign. Um, and if it, was, if it had to destroy it and then recreate it, it would be minus slash plus. If it, if it could create it first and then destroy it to minimize downtime, it would be a plus slash minus. Um, but it shows you exactly what's going to happen. Um, and if the DigitalOcean droplet existed, and I changed the IP address, which in, or, or the image, which in DigitalOcean requires a recreate. Next to that change on there, it would have in parentheses that it says forces new resource. And that tells the operator that that specific change is what's causing the downtime causing operation. And so the way that affects you on a day-to-day -day life is you see that, you're like, oh, well, maybe we could do that one, schedule a maintenance, and let's do that one later so that we could do the, the other 30 changes in place that cause no downtime. Um, that's something that is very hard to do with CloudFormation. Like I said, it requires effectively uh, an oracle of the cloud. Um, you could also see how it, it's going to create the DNS record. It doesn't know the value of it, but it tells you it's going to be related to that DigitalOcean droplet. So you can see stuff like that. So the plan shows you what will happen, uh, and then you could go one step further. You could actually save the plan out of Terraform to guarantee what will happen. Um, so this is kind of similar to a no-op mode, um, but, but stricter guarantees. If you see a plan and you save it and you, you give that plan to Terraform, it'll only do those things. Even if the state of the world changed so that that plan's invalid anymore, it'll still just ignore the current state of the world and only do what you told it to do. Uh, and that's very important, too, because it would it would be unfortunate to run a plan, see a completely in-place update, but since the state of the world changed, when you run apply, it now causes downtime. Like That would be very unexpected um, and would probably be disruptive. So the saving plans lets you get predictability. Again, determinism. So the workflow working with Terraform, and this is the workflow we're trying to solve, remember, at a higher level, not a technology-specific level, is to treat your infrastructure like an application. Make code changes to describe infrastructure, run a plan, make a pull request or you know some sort of review, code review request uh, to merge that thing in. So you can see the code, so you can see the source form of what you're changing. You can sort of see the binary form of what will change in production, um, and then review and merge them. And when you merge it, the exact thing happens. And it lets you treat infrastructure like an application. Not just, it's not just infrastructure as code, it's, it's quite literally infrastructure as an application. Um, and that's relatively uh, novel. So going further, um, you want to be able to delegate. Like I said, you want to be able to delegate operational knowledge and responsibility to smaller teams in order to scale um, from a human perspective. So there's two ways to do this. You could do knowledge sharing through something called modules in Terraform that encapsulates a bunch of knowledge of how to manage infrastructure into a black box. Um, and so in this case, uh, we have a module called console um, we specify some parameter, which is number of servers. Um, I think the talk before mentioned console, but it's a distributed system that does service discovery. Oh, I'm talking about it after this, after Terraform. But um, anyway, if you were to paste this module in there, that would actually, on AWS, it would actually spin up a three-server console cluster that's properly formed into a cluster um, and also output its address for you. So you could see, actually, I don't, I don't highlight it, but down here I, use the, I get the address out of that module. So it's sort of a black box. You gave it some inputs and you get some outputs, but the person using that module doesn't need to know how to manage console. Like Someone else put that knowledge in there and is sharing it with them. Um, and so that makes it more scalable as a team. Uh, the other thing you could do is resource sharing. And I'll explain the difference between these because I know they're not obvious. So in this case, we're effectively doing the same thing uh, with, a, with a difference. So modules are knowledge sharing in terms of when you use a module, it's going to create new servers, and you manage those servers, and you affect change on those servers. Um, it's, it's knowledge sharing and how to build something. Um, remote state is resource sharing. So resource sharing is is I'll give you information about the console cluster, but you can't touch it. You can't touch the servers, you can't modify them, you can't force change on them, that I manage them. And, and the use case for this is imagine a core IT or operations team that 
manages a highly available um, database cluster. Like that's very complicated. And instead of doing knowledge sharing for that, where every team has a potentially highly available database cluster, but that requires people to help out with, um, you just instead share resources. So it's like I'm going to give you access to the database cluster, but you can never ever touch these servers other than through the API layer. Um, so that's what this is doing. It's saying that there exists some external console server, and I want the address to it. Uh, so I'm going to skip these just to get going. Um, but the next thing I want to talk about is console. Um, so console in its marketing speech is service discovery, configuration, and orchestration made easy. Um, it's a distributed system. It's very highly available. And it works with multiple data centers out of the box. Um, that's a very dense thing. And I could, I could defend every word in that statement. But it's a lot easier to explain it this way. So the questions that console answers is, um, where is some service? Where is the, I'm a web server. Where is the database? I'm a load balancer. Where are the web servers I'm load balancing to? It answers that question. Um, what is the health of service foo? Like when I ask for the database, don't give, me, don't give me one you know is down. Give me the one you know is working. Um, or as a load balancer, same thing. Um, what is the inventory of running machines and services that I have? Um, what are the configuration for those services? Um, and orchestration things like, is anyone else performing a certain operation, locking effectively? Um, so to go through each of those features, service discovery, where is some service foo? Um, the way that looks in console is through DNS. It looks like this. So you, console exposes DNS. It's the lowest common denominator um, to do service discovery. And that lets you start using console without building it into applications. So um, a, a comparable solution to, to console, which is more legacy, is ZooKeeper. Um, ZooKeeper is hard to use because the clients are smart and the servers are dumb. So uh, that means that every client needs to very intimately know it's talking to ZooKeeper and how to, how to do that communication dance. Um, with console, it's, it's reversed. And so the clients are really dumb. So you just need DNS. At the lowest common denominator, you just need DNS. Legacy applications can, easy, can easily plug into console without an issue. Um, there's also an HTTP API if you want more information. But like 1% of the cases need that. 99% of the time, you're just using DNS. So like I said, DNS legacy friendly. Um, the last bullet point is also very important. Um, console could register not only internal services. So when you ask for a database, you might not only get uh, a private IP of something internally, if, if we're living in some future where you're using an external software as a service, console might also return to you that address. So you could register external services with console. Um, and that's a very good example of how, um, how we design our tools for this modern data center as I described earlier. Um, so yeah, service discovery. The next thing it does is failure detection. So given that you can now find services, uh, you generally want to only find services that are healthy. Um, or you just want to use console as a monitoring tool, and that's completely valid. Um, that's a bad slide. Um, so the way service discovery works um, is that if a service is known as unhealthy, um, the DNS will not return that service to you, because what's the point? Um, and then you could also check the, the health check through HTTP. Um, the, the difference between console and a traditional service uh, monitoring tool is that cons it, console does it in a very distributed way. Each, each agent on its agent base, so each agent on every node knows the services it has on its server and manages the monitoring there. And it only communicates to a central server when there's a state change. So instead of something like uh, Nagios, which is some very, very smart central server, um, which is doing this pool-based, like sending data to things, running something on this very large scale. So every server you add increases the load on that one server. Um, console is very distributed, so the load is amortized across your entire data center. It's very lightweight, and it generally doesn't even affect the network because um, the only thing sent across the network is state changes, which are relatively infrequent. Um, so console is a very scalable monitoring tool that it also incorporates into service discovery. So a lot of people ask, why does it do both service discovery and service monitoring? And it's because they're very closely tied things that you want together. Um, and then there's key value storage. So another thing of why would console do this? And, and it's also another thing that's very closely tied to services. So um, you have the service. You know it's healthy. Or you are the service foo, and you're reporting you're healthy. Now you want to know, like, what are some runtime configuration things that I have? Um, and, and the first question we always get when people are adopting console with the key value store is, 
is where does what's the difference between this and something like config management? When do I use config management? When do I use console? Um, and the difference I like to make is config management is for very static configuration changes. You're laying down files that are relatively infrequent. Because imagine the config management's quite slow at configuration update. You push something, and maybe over the next 30 minutes it rolls out to your data center. Um, console, on the other hand, is for, for runtime changes, or as an analogy, it's for the knobs of your applications or services. It's for the port it's running on, whether it's in maintenance mode, feature flags, and whether things are enabled, um, the number of workers that it should have, things like that. And the difference um, with the configuration through console is it's long polling based, it's edge triggered. So when you make a change in console, a lot of the times, by the time you go check if it's already done, even if it's alt tab and refresh the page, uh, it's already rolled out. Um, and sort of as a time scale, if you have 4,000 servers connected to console at one time, uh, the, the speed at which that one change gets rolled out is less than 100 milliseconds with a good network or less than a second with a somewhat lossy network. So um, it's pretty fast. So it's, it's probably faster than you could check. And the key value store is really simple. It's just a REST API. So you put stuff in, you pull stuff out. Very straightforward. So the data is highly available. Um, I've given a full talk on consoles operational bullet points, so I won't do it justice by, by explaining here, but if you go to the console website, we link to all the papers that it's built off of, we link to the architecture diagrams, um, all the reasons that it makes this highly available. Um, and I could, I could confidently say that console's in use um, by over 10% of the, well, I, that gives you over, over um, I don't know, but over 10% of the top 50 websites, and there's never ever been a single case of data loss ever um, in, those, in, that, in its entire lifetime. Um, the key value storage, you're able to turn knobs without um, any big config management process. It's much, much faster than config management, but it also has the effect of making your config management much faster, um, because a lot of times the slow parts of Chef or Puppet are when you're doing things like Chef Search or Puppet external resources, when it's reaching out to a Puppet server or Chef server and asking about things. That's what makes things quite slow. Um, and when you adopt console, you break down things. So config management now is basically installing packages, setting up users, and throwing down files, which is all pretty fast, um, especially like if you have an internal package server. So given that, um, your config management becomes much faster, and then your, your runtime configuration also becomes much faster. It's, it's a win-win. Um, yeah. So then it's multi-data center out of the box. Um, this was an interesting design decision, but a, a lot of software, like such as Zookeeper, um, they solve a problem, and then, but realistically, you're in multiple data centers. Uh, even smaller companies are in multiple data centers because of AWS regions and how easy it makes it. Um, and when you reach that multiple data center scale point, a lot of software says, figure it out. Like, too bad. We work in this like, LAN environment over a WAN. Like, good luck unknowns, um, and that kind of sucks. So we built multi-data center stuff right into it. Um, just to show you how easy it is, here's how you do service discovery across data centers. Perhaps you're trying to find the web front ends in Singapore and Germany. You just prefix it in there. Um, or you're doing KV across data centers. So each data center could have its own individual uh, configuration. So the way it basically works in console is it's local by default. If you omit a data center, it assumes you mean the current data center, which is generally true. Um, but you can query other data centers if you want. And it doesn't put the burden on you to find the other data center or something. All the console servers register with each other. They know all the other data centers. And even if you ask Singapore to give you Germany's web servers, Singapore, the, the console server, like I said, is the smart thing. The clients are dumb. The console server will forward your request for you, get the response, and then forward the response back to you. So it, it lowers the burden on you as a developer um, quite a bit. And then sort of the last major thing of console's orchestration. Um, so. There's four parts of console uh, orchestration, e events, execs, locks, and watches. And they look like this. So at the top, we're, we're sending an event. So an event is a very lightweight piece of information that is broadcasted to the entire cluster. And I know I'm at like a Cisco conference, so when I say broadcast, there's probably some like fear involved in, in, in how expensive that might be. Um, our broadcast mechanism uses uh, a gossip protocol underneath that makes it very, very, very efficient. Um, it's, the gossip protocol has been shown to be able to send messages with sub-second latencies on clusters as big as 40,000 servers. Uh, it's not going to be a scale problem. And then the bandwidth it uses will not, I promise, will not even show up on your network graph unless you care about kilobits. 
Um, so it's very small, very lightweight. And, and again, the website has all the research behind that. Um, after you send an event, there's watches. Watches are the things that wait for an event um, and then do something. So in this case, the watch is waiting for that deploy event, and after it gets it, it's executing the deploy script. Um, and then finally, there's exec. And exec is heavier weight than an event. Uh, what exec does is actually, instead of using the gossip protocol underneath, it makes a direct connection to the thing you're trying to execute. So in this case, all the web service machines, it'll make a, from the console server, it'll make a direct connection to all of them, execute some script, and relay back all the information. It's, it's basically a much better SSH for loop because uh, it's not one. It's, it's, it's more like pub sub type based. So the idea behind these orchestration tools is they're powerful, uh, but they're generally primitives. Console on its own is not a orchestration solution so much as it's orchestration Lego pieces. Um, so on top of console, you could easily build, build any sort of orchestration tool you want, um, but it just gives you sort of that thing. Um, I'm going to skip that. So the workflow behind console is basically you start the server with something like Terraform. Um, you start the console agent, it joins the cluster, um, it, it figures out all its, its uh, peers, uh, and then all the service discovery becomes available. So when you start using something like console, you get this thing where you could start all your servers sort of in parallel um, because they'll only start discovering their dependencies when they become healthy. Um, and that makes it a lot easier from a scalability perspective because if you, if you have an ordering where it's like the database must start before this application and before the load balancer and all these things, it makes things a lot harder operationally. Um, when you fully adopt something like Terraform and console, it basically be, becomes spin everything up in parallel. Eventually, they're all going to connect together and things are going to come online. And I could watch the console UI um, to see things that are happening um, as they're coming online. So here are some operational bullet points. Like I said, I've given a full talk, like a full hour and a half talk on the operation, the research behind console, why it won't lose your data, things like that. Um, but here's sort of just the operational things. Um, the important points besides the top three, I guess. Um, so the full network, all the network traffic, everything is, can be encrypted. Um, there's also ACLs across everything. Um, and this last data point is actually kind of outdated. The real world usage um, that we have with some console clusters is now up to, like I said, 40,000 servers in a data center. Um, and it still hasn't, hasn't failed. Um, and, and so I should, before I end here, um, I just want to say that Terraform and Console are both very battle hardened, um, and I'm happy to give you case studies if you needed them, um, but we haven't yet published them publicly, so there's that. Um, but that's all there is to it, so thank you. Um, I don't know if there's time for questions, but thank you. No, unfortunately not, but Mitchell, thank you very much.